looking at so far where we are today, where my role in ASEAN as chair of the private sector, this event happened about a couple of weeks back, it was the ASEAN Business Awards, and I'm proud to say that we did shock the entire ASEAN 10 countries. They thought the Philippines would not outdo Malaysia, etc. But we did, in fact, I was surprised myself that the execution, the creativity is really Filipino. And the following day, we were congratulated by the cabinet, the economic ministers, and finally, it was very easy for me to get appointments with the ambassadors for the next event in November. The largest and biggest private sector event. We've invited 12 state leaders and top business leaders all over the Tennessee and countries and our joint business partners. Um, so far, we have indication that uh, President Trump and his daughter will be attending. Hopefully that materializes. We have also uh, Prime Minister Modi, Premier Li of China, and so forth. And the invitation and the uh, publication of uh, the event and all the, um, the event uh, registration and will start this coming week. So I invite all of you to participate in this once-in-a-lifetime event. The next time our president would host a CN will never happen because it will happen 10 years from today. So this is the last international event that President Duterte will host during his term. Again, as all of you know, the pursuit of helping micro entrepreneurs has started way back during the time I was involved with Tony Gosho. And as an advisor to the President then, PGMA, I never wavered. It has continued until this very day. And despite countless of people asking me, oh, why didn't you become secretary or run for the Senate or whatever, I always did, said, that is not in my blood. And we have better people who do that, that job. And like Senator Mix, Senator Bam, and many other senators there, they can represent what the private sector wants to see, a great macro environment. My role today as an advisor and as a CN back chair is really bring about a stronger partnership with government and the private sector. That is my number one objective. And how do we intend to do that? You have heard of Secretary Juan Lopez talking about his seven M's. But the private sector is going to focus on three M's. Basically, the three seven M's can be summarized into three M's. Mentorship, money, and market. Some of you may have heard this line of mine, but this is the most important focus for the private sector. When we talk about mentorship, many of you in this room, I'm told how many, a couple of hundred mentees are already going through the program. And the power of mentorship, we all know, is so immense. Formal mentorship is our own education at school. Informal mentorship is the values that you learn from your, learn from your parents as the day you were born and, and you're formed into what you are today. Successful people. I myself, unknowingly, was mentored by father. Ten years today, I'm the ASEAN back chair. What are the odds of that happening? But ten years ago, he was the ASEAN chair. And in this time, out of the blue, with no experience in ASEAN. I didn't even understand what ASEAN was all about. I attended the first engagement a year ago, not knowing who are even the members of ASEAN. That's how poor my knowledge, and that's how poor the knowledge of many Filipinos out there, especially our millennials, who do not even understand what ASEAN is all about. They understand APEC clearly because of the traffic. But under this presidency, there will be no traffic that they can guarantee. Because there is not going to be work at school for three days. And as much as possible, the 
flights of most of the state leaders will have to land in Clark. I don't know how that's possible with America landing their plane in Clark and having to take a car all the way to Manila. I don't think uh, President Trump will agree to that. But then if they agree to President Trump, then they'll have to agree to everybody. So maybe they all have to land in Manila. But having said that, a CN event that we are having today is really something. I look at it as a brotherhood, as a brotherhood of 10 nations coming together. What I've learned in this ASEAN Business Advisory Council is building a relationship. Relationship is definitely powerful. When we apply this to our mentorship program, it is really building the trust, learning the right values of successful entrepreneurs out there. What made them move up the chain, the ladder? Some say it's education, right, Lisa? But when I look around the many entrepreneurs in this room who are successful, not many of them are the brightest in their class. Not many of them even made it through college. So what is it in that entrepreneur? that has made him successful. It is the mentoring that has started from the day he was born to his formal education in mentorship. And as he moved on, the people around him who had the right values of a positive thinking latched on and they continued to possess that. And you can see all these entrepreneurs. Many of them are successful Filipino Chinese families. And you can see the mentorship that is so immense that comes from the very age that they are born. They are taught of the value of money, hard work, extreme hard work in fact. Some of my friends, they don't even have Saturday off. Some of them even work on Sunday. Maybe that's the extreme. But that's to show you how driven they are and how driven successful entrepreneurs must be. So that mentorship program is being cascaded now are in a partnership, of course, with DDI, the regional directors, the provincial directors. The private sector is the component of bringing these mentors to help. And we have now, I'm told, 450 mentors that have been helping many of our micro and small entrepreneurs, who you know comprises 99.6% of the entire business community. If we are to include these people as players in the business community, they are 99.6. And we guys who control the large and extra large are 0.4. So moving forward, we will scale that up. And I'm glad that Senator Zubiri increased the budget of DTI for shared service facilities and for programs and such as this because this is what we need. We have to help those who help themselves. In fact, I am not a believer of the conditional cash transfer. I think it leads to useless spending. And the moment you pull out that check, the guy is not going to get anywhere. We have to help those people who help themselves. I think handing over a check doesn't make the person productive. And I hope down the road, we will be able to convince our legislators and the cabinet to think otherwise and push that money to more lending to our entrepreneurs, especially the migrants small. Charging interest rates, forget it. I mean, I'm not against charging anybody the right rate. I mean, not even against our Indian friends who are into the 5-6 because they collect almost daily 10 pesos, 20 pesos, 50 pesos. And eventually, if we, there are more of them, and the whole system, in fact, interest rates even in the 5-6 have started to go down. But they don't lend with collateral. So if we want to bring down the interest rates of the 5-6, we flush in more money into micro and small lending. And do not require collateral up to a certain level of lending. I talked to Governor Nestor Espinilla and told him that 
the way forward is to not penalize big banks on their low performance, especially when they lend to micro and small. So that is the, the second M, the money part. So you have the mentoring, you have the money part. This is where we have to bring about inclusive financing. That is the most important. And to me, it is the collateral that is the biggest problem because many of our micro and small entrepreneurs do not have collateral to scale up. In India, in China, I'm told, they don't require collateral. The state really helps them and funds them in many of their uh, projects and endeavors and ideas. And that's what we have to do. Help the people who help themselves. So the money part is very important. Big banks have to start to buy rural banks because in the last ASEAN crisis, more than half of the rural banks have been wiped out. And this is a result of where why lending is not reaching down to the micro and small level. Because big banks have a hard time reaching out because they don't have the conduit to do so. And I'm glad that BDO has started with one network bank. They're very aggressive right now. They're taking the lead and that is good. And I hope all the other big banks do the same. The last M is market. As you know, Without market, whether you mentor, whether you have the money, but you don't have the market, you don't have a business. So market is important. And how do we help our micro and small get access to market? Right now, our entire economy is still what I call traditional economy, brick and mortar economy. The future is going to be the digital economy. But let's focus on the brick and mortar economy because that is where we are today. What is that? How do we get them to the markets? Large corporations have to bring them in as part of their supply chain. And that's part of inclusive business. We have to train our Sari Sari stores on how to better manage their business. And that is happening with Coca-Cola, our own company with Selecta Ice Cream, why? Because we use the Sari Sari stores to sell our product. So it is to our interest, actually, to, to teach them, mentor them. And we have various programs. So Coke, in fairness, has a very intensive program in, in mentoring Sari Sari stores. And Sari Sari stores are here to stay. For as long as there's poverty, extreme poverty, Sari Sari stores are here. No matter how many convenience stores you have, they are nowhere close to the number of Sari Sari stores. Because the poor families do not have enough capital to stock in their pantry. They cannot afford to have a refrigerator, an air condition, a freezer. So they buy their soft drinks, their ice cream, and their whatever they need. And they are lent actually money for me through a uh, simple notebook where they, I'm sure all of you know this, and to become a number one brand in the Philippines is you have to be in Sari Sari stores. So, looking at the market, we have to move towards inclusive business. And that has to really be done through mentorship, mentoring them on how to run their business, absorbing, absorbing them in the, the current businesses we're in. That is the fastest way. We can help them mentor them, market their product, and become their, in fact, even a distributor in exporting. So that is in the brick and mortar space. We're transitioning, although in the Philippines, slowly towards the digital economy. But to me, the digital economy is really going to be the game changer for many of our micro and small entrepreneurs. Why? I don't know if you have Uber and Grab in Cebu. But if you do, how much is it now to hire a driver? It's so expensive. They have set the floor. Why? Because now you can be an entrepreneur overnight. You can go to our car company, take a lease on a car, become your own boss, and drive and join Uber, Grab. And there'll be more platforms down the road. 
this now is the game changer. Because I, Uber driver, with my rating, if I'm rated high, I can be definitely one of the most sought after drivers. And number two, the biggest advantage to that is I can grow my feet on my own. He does not need to go through the brick and mortar economy. Frankly speaking, the brick and mortar economy is controlled by large companies. Myself, all the supermarkets, we control that. The TV stations, how much do you have to pay to advertise your product today? $10,000, a million pesos today for a 30 second spot in a prime time show. It's too expensive. When I built our brand in Selecta, then Cosmos, that was like 25 years ago, and it was very cheap. So that is one challenge that many of our migrant entrepreneurs face. When you get into a supermarket chain, the requirement of listing fees is so high. And that's a fact. To be able to get the space, you have to pay for that space. We're not accepted from that. We accept that. So the cost of putting your product in the supermarket is the next challenge. And that is the brick and mortar space. So how does that happen for many of our micro entrepreneurs out there? Now we will try to, together with Mon Lopez and DDI, is to appeal to many of our supermarket owners and retail stores to allow at least a space for these products to be displayed, even for a period of six months, and change it and give others a chance. So, but with Lazada, Alibaba, Amazon, who supported the PI in the Philippines, just Lazada alone, you can market your products in Lazada. Of course, the digital economy is maybe just 0.5% yet at this point in time. Maybe different in advertising, it's more accelerated, but in the marketplace, it's not, except for services like Uber and Grab. But in the case of a marketplace for goods, it's still very far, but it's happening now in America. I can order a can of corned beef or whatever and send it to my place in San Francisco. You don't need to go to the supermarket anymore and delivery is free. So the digital economy is definitely the future for many of our micro entrepreneurs. In the meantime, the brick and mortar economy, which we are in today, we have to make it work because it will take time for this transition to the digital economy. And my wish is that our regulators do not overregulate something that they don't know. Like in the case of Uber and Grab, I really found that ridiculous. I mean, in the end, let it run. Let us understand how this works. It is the game changer to helping really poor entrepreneurs be the chance to be their own boss. And now, taxi drivers will have to shape up or become, or quit, or maybe join and become Uber Grab. It has leveled up the level of service because the rating system is there. I have an app right now, and I've shared this with many people, called Xenia. It's not a local invention. But where you can get a masseuse in your home in 10 to 30 minutes. When I looked at this app, a year ago, there were only 20. Today, there are over 200 and growing. And I've been interviewing many of these people doing massage services. Come to your home, like Uber, exactly. You can track them where they are. You don't need to pay them. Everything is there. If you want to put the tip, mark it. Excellent using the credit card. This is the game change. You don't need to go to a spa anymore. The spa is in your house. We need more of this marketplace to be developed. And that is the way forward, believe me. There is no other way. Tesla, I met with the uh, current boss there, and I was telling him, oh, we're producing so many people. Develop a marketplace for electricians, plumbers, and what have you, IT professionals, so when they put their services in a marketplace, then people like us can look for them and hire them, and then eventually they become their own boss. And that is what's to happen. So to me, the future for many of our micro entrepreneurs is the digital economy. And it's going to happen. 
Look, Smart are accelerating on the FinTech. Many other companies are coming here to look at payment solutions. I know many Filipinos don't use credit cards, and that's why Lazada accepts cash. But we have to find a workaround there on how we can eventually get Filipinos to either use a debit card and trust the system that it does work, that you're protected against fraud. And maybe there could be an insurance against fraud. You know, I mean, I don't know how many in this room use Amazon. It's fabulous. I mean, you, you know, in my, America, you can save time. You don't need to shop. Of course, my wife loves to shop because she has to see the clothes and all of that. But us men, we are simple. I mean, we just like to wear jeans, the same jeans every day, the same t-shirt every day. So we're not as, uh, you know, we don't need to fix ourselves that much. I guess the older we get, then we have to fix ourselves even more. So that is how I view helping our entrepreneurs. Brick and mortar, we have to act now. The future, let's all come together and people are coming together to make it happen. And I'm glad entrepreneurs, especially the young kids today who are evolving, we don't anymore see them because they're in the room. It's the bad part. They communicate with their friends. Now they have this new chat where they can have what they call house chat. They can be chatting with seven people at the same time all over the world. Pretty soon, they will just be stuck to their phone. My wife blames me on being in my phone every day. But I say it's because of ASEAN. But that's the way we live in. We are now addicted to our cell phone. Not to our TV, but to our cell phone. And it's migrating towards that. Without the cell phone, I mean, booking a car, booking a hotel, etc. So the future is really the digital economy. But having said that, what is under threat, under a digital economy, is our PPO sector. By far, it is going to be endangered. Um, if any of you bought this gadget called Alexa in Amazon, it's a simple little speaker box that you can talk to. And the speed when you say Alexa, play this music for me. Within one second that music is playing. Within one second you can ask about traffic, etc. Time, when you have everything. This thing is getting more intelligent. And now they're being rivaled by Apple. So remember the engineers in the Silicon Valley are trying to make a human being. Okay? And it was used to be just in the movies where you see these things. The robots, people talking to you. You know, one day, you can even have sex talking to your robot box. <laughs> Seriously speaking, that's not very far. So, the creativity is out there, pushing. People are competing to be the first mover. Even, you know, Musk is developing, you know, a car that doesn't need a driver. I don't think that will work in the Philippines, but uh, it's going to happen. So eventually what we watched in the movies when we were young kids is really happening today. It is a threat to many in the brick and mortar business, definitely. Supermarkets, department stores, BPO, but it's an opportunity for many micro and small entrepreneurs to have a chance to be next, to be the next multi-billionaire or even billionaire. Companies that don't even make money but have the promise of revolutionizing what is the future are rewarded with a 100 to 200 PE ratio. That is the future. And I'm not saying we abandon the brick and mortar because that's here for quite some time. We prepare for the digital economy, we push it because it will help the micro-entrepreneurs. But currently, under our traditional economy, we already have to throw the lifeline. Mentorship, money, and market. In the end, after the ASEAN event is over, I requested uh, Secretary Secretary Bingo Middledia to really create 
to an, an executive order a prosperity council. A prosperity for all council, composed of the business chambers who I am now brought in together as part of an alliance. The large conglomerates today are all together. I put them together, the tight pants, the big guys are now in one room working together. In fact, next week, we have a meeting with some of the secretaries to really push one of the three M's, which is market. We got to build the airports, we got to build the bridges, the roads, all of that. We have to be open to bringing back PPP. We need the entrepreneurs to help government. Government is there for six years. After six years, they change everybody. So how can you have continuity? How can you have a vision? Your export, your, your Cebu airport here under Edgar Saradia of Megawide, you know what his vision is? He's part of this group. His vision is to beat the Philippines, to beat Manila. He wants everybody to land in Cebu and take a flight to Manila. That means to listen here will really explode. He wants Cebu to be the capital of all where, like where all these planes land and go to Iluyo, go to Boracay, go to Daba, etc. Damn it, what a fantastic vision. Will you get that from a secretary? Not really, because that is unique. That talent comes from an entrepreneur. It is not whether the airport is nicely built. It is the vision of what that problem should be. And that is my message to many of our hardworking cabinet secretaries. Bring back that private-public partnership. Change the terms, considering interest rates are low, so returns can go down. But without the private sector, you will not have the continuity in vision. And so through this prosperity council where private sector really comes together, who will build, okay, give the subway to the government to build because it's going to be too expensive with the railroad, but the management can be bidded out down the road. And eventually, you know, the private sector is really the best in really managing things under proper rules. And the government regulates and makes sure that the public is always taken care of in terms of rates, efficiency, and etc. So this partnership has to strengthen. And that is my role as an advisor to the president, to really strengthen that relationship. And hopefully, if nothing is going to happen within this next year, I don't think the president will see anything built by the end of his term. So it has to happen and initiated soon. And hopefully, in this next meeting, we will be able to solve the airports. And that's the first goal. Let's build the airport. If somebody wants to build the airport in Bulacan, Go, let him, no conditions. If the one, somebody has a bid for me, yeah, go, let him do it. If somebody wants to do something, have three airports in Manila, anyway, it's their risk, it's their balance sheet that will be affected. Let's not affect the balance sheet of the government. Because if the government starts loading that balance sheet and doesn't manage it on the long term, they will be affected, us, the Filipinos, will be affected. And under the procurement system, lowest bid, lowest price is not always the right thing. So how do you do that? Give to the private sector under the right terms. Get them to be the drivers. So the market, which is the last and most important, access to market. Imagine 7,100 islands. You will now develop all these islands to tourist destinations. Boraca today, an Airbus 320 landing from all other countries. Amazing. It's so hard to get place that it's cheaper for me to go to Hong Kong, Thailand, and other places than to go to Baraka. Baraka today is too expensive. But that is what you want to see. You want more of this. You want more airports that then can take an Airbus 320. You want more ports, you want more roads so that the farmers and the traders and the entrepreneurs can get their produce to Manila at the lowest cost. Shipping rates are a joke in this country. So you have to improve our ports, you have to improve the dredging so that big ships can come in. All of this cannot be done by government because they are also running many 
of the things in their department. And they don't have the time. We don't even have the pay to pay these people. What we pay, I mean, I pay a marketing guy 250,000 bucks a month, okay? A top marketing guy. Then I'm already the cheap guy out there. People out pay a million bucks. So how can you pay an executive in government that much? The people will get pissed. But that is what you get for good service. The creativity, the determination, the passion, and all of that. I'm not saying our secretaries are doing a bad job. They're honest, they're hardworking. But you can never replace the drive of a successful entrepreneur. A Egypt CEO from nothing in Iloilo who had the dream of creating a Manginasal who today has owned Double Dragon and market cap of close to two and a half billion dollars. And he's still below 40 years old. This is the kind of entrepreneur that we need. The Edgar Sarabendia, who is running Megawide, going to build your airport, he's already thinking of the second runway. What an amazing entrepreneur. And I don't mind if he wins all the airports. I mean, at the end of the day, let's just get it on. Because tourism is the next big thing. Without tourism, how will these entrepreneurs make a living? So we have to create the macro environment from the digital economy to tourism to all of this and make it work. Filipinos are creative. I believe that this country can really be great. Our president is doing the right thing. To me, unless it destroys all of these warlords, federalism will fail. And I'm glad we have to compress. We cannot have 13 federal states as a joke. My grandfather wrote the book at this time of being a federal state. And his vision was to zone Visayas and Mindanao, just three. I think it's the same thing. Or else we will have 13 presidents in this country, 15 presidents in this country, plus the major president. Wow, it's going to be so expensive to do big business in the Philippines because each one will want their own way. So we have to simplify the vision of the president. I think it is in the right direction that we move towards the federalism, but we should look at the number of federal states. So, it is really a partnering of public and private sector efforts to come together. What ASEAN is, is a brotherhood of 10 countries and leaving no one behind. Same principle in this country, leaving no one behind. We have left people behind, I have to admit. Yes, we know he did a great job in his time. We were rated investment rate, but why did they not vote for Marlowe's? It's because, you know, how much will it cost you who did not buy a home to buy a home today? I mean, in Makati, it's a joke. I don't in Cebu. I heard from some people that the prices of real estate here is also getting really high. So all of this, 99.6, all of those at the poverty level missed it because not because they didn't want to, but they just, just didn't have the money to invest. So, we, I'm saying we, including myself, we were fortunate. We live in a home in Makati, my stocks are listed, done up five times in value, without really doing anything. Same thing. What was it before and what is it now? We're doing the same thing. It just went up. Why? Because we were rated, investment rate, that means the Philippines is being managed properly. That is all what it means to me. Our balance sheet is great. Our source of revenue is great. And the rich became richer. Now, this present means something. You, rich, do something about the poor. Or else you are my enemy. Right tagline. We have to do something. Because in the end, if the poor become wealthier, we all benefit from a growing economy. But we have to create this entire macro environment. Our legislators must make the game conducive to investment spending. Us, the private sector, from our own heart, must really practice inclusivity. And then we can create prosperity for every Filipino in this country. Thank you.